All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Isbu podcast. Uh, we got Cobham crew today. Phil joining us at Chelsea Youth. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. Thank you very much. It's been an interesting few weeks, shall we say. Um, but academy football is back, not just preseason, proper competitive PL2 and under 18 football. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about uh, across everything happening on the pitch and off the pitch. Yeah, no, for Which sure. That was such a met- surprise. Yeah, that was such a measured. I'm good. I I need to be I need to guard what I say. Make sure it's measured. It's uh, an interesting time for the academy, both chaotic but also exciting. Like you said, they're the actual season is kicked off. Uh, we have results to talk about, which we will. But there's no hiding the the understandable frustrations on your side is you know with that as well so let's just kick it off lewis hall uh, unveiled as a newcastle low knee there's an obligation to buy so while i tweeted yes i'm glad it wasn't a sales only loan everyone was quick to point out well there's a, an obligation to buy and i just reminded you all i'll deal with those emotions in a year for now <laughs> i'm gonna pretend but uh weird saga crystal palace loan before that signed a six plus one extension and then out of nowhere, Newcastle come crashing in. Apparently, they want Cobham on the left, Cobham on the right. Yeah, something like that. And I think you've hit the nail on the head that it is almost entirely out of the blue. I say almost because there was talk earlier in the window linking Lewis with Newcastle. And you'd think when a 6 plus 1 contract is signed that that's not going to happen. So for that to happen, followed by days later, this permanent transfer and it is permanent you're gonna to have to deal with those feelings now i have to you have to but we'll deal with it every month of every year until the end of that contract i imagine because i think it's a mistake i've not exactly been shy about uh, those feelings on, on social media and on twitter i don't think that chelsea needed to sell certainly from a footballing perspective i think that the reports that are coming out that the negotiations were handled predominantly by Todd Bowley with Amanda Stavely at Newcastle in immediate reaction to spending more than they wanted to on Moises Casado aren't a coincidence. I think this is possibly and more probably business first, football second, which is never a healthy way to run a club. Um, But yeah, there's no urgency to sell a player who is your reigning Academy Player of the Year, who was one of the few very bright spots from last season, that a season which, based on this summer's actions, the club are trying to completely erase from history insofar as almost everybody connected with it seems to have been pushed towards the exit door. There are scant few people who are remaining in prominent positions, the captain, the vice-captain, the vice-captain, Thiago Silva, and, and very, very few others have been allowed to keep their place in this squad and time will tell whether this is a good or a bad thing right or wrong but if you're having a clear out it doesn't need to be led or not even led it doesn't need to involve an 18 year old breakthrough prospect who's proven that he can play at a high level in a number of different positions and and yeah I mean that's kind of the the long and the short of it I think that uh, you're you you and Matt definitely have kind of opened my eyes to that, right? That the Liverpool hijacking of Casado played right into Brighton's hand, made it a bidding war. Then Chelsea had to hijack the hijack and match any bid, which apparently Liverpool were willing to to go to crazy lengths to sign Casado. He he turned him down. And then at the end of the day, you're like, well, we just spent 25 million more than what we were planning to. And we know FFP and whatever the Premier League financial rules are, um, you know, we're definitely a top concern for this ownership group. They had to make that money up quick. And Lewis Hall, unfortunately, was the easiest of those options. Man, does that suck? Like, I, I told, I tweeted it. You and I have talked. Like, I love Lewis Hall. I just think he's such a down to earth guy. Just wants to play football. He's not distracted by other things. Really quiet. Um, was so good in so many dis- positions and decision making because he's so cool and composed. Got you know a few minutes in preseason, but really nothing there. But to have a team like Newcastle come in, I I just there better be some kind of message coming out from the club saying like, look, we 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 had we had to sacrifice Lewis because 
our sporting directors and owners made mistakes. We apologize. We wish we didn't have to, but it was a forced requirement. Of course, we'll never get it. But what does this mean? You for- might get it at a private equity conference or something like True. that. They speak on the record in the financial world. They don't tend to speak on the record in the football world. And that's whatever. If the ownership don't want to do that, then they don't want to do that. You maybe think of one of however many sporting directors or people on that level, the club employ, would also do the same. But again, we have to go back to Michael Abinalo for the last person who was either willing or indeed allowed to communicate in such a way it's not really the done thing in English football I know Brighton CEO Paul Barber spoke to the media last week and it was extremely rare um, it's not like in Germany where Bundesliga sporting directors and directors of football will happily speak to anybody and everybody it's sort of a seen and not heard role in England and I don't think it's for the better anyway fair fair enough uh, it sounds like there's probably one more common graduate ready to leave this summer I guess I shouldn't say ready to leave right but maybe tagged is leaving Matt Law saying that they're listening to offers for Conor Gallagher. They're listening to offers for Trevor Chalaba, even though he's injured. Uh, And then the one that's a little bit concerning is Ian Motson didn't play in the last match. I'm not going to ask you who you think is going to go because that doesn't really matter. I guess my question, and this is what we always ask is, what do you think this is doing down line to the players like Omari Hutchinson, uh, Chester Cassidy, um, you know, uh, there's many more, maybe even, um, oh, gee, Charlie Webster, right? Who we barely retained and, and so many other players. Do you feel like there's concern or trepidation from them or do they still go, hey, Chelsea's the best academy to be developed at. Uh, I want to come here and, and learn my football. Do you, do you feel like this is a one-off or there is some concern now? I think, as always, and this isn't me sitting on the fence or giving a cop-out answer, it is going to be a fairly mixed bag of responses and feelings across the board, depending on players' personalities, their situations, the point of their career they're all at. And whatever was being thought through, I think Lewis's move will definitely open a few eyes. Because you can you can realistically make the argument that all of the other academy graduates that left this summer there was a footballing reason for their departure or a, 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 an adjacent reason. So obviously Mason Mount had contract dispute. Ruben Loftus-Cheek was reportedly on a higher wage and getting towards the back end of his 20s. And you can just roll through some of those excuses. Ethan Ampadu had had relegation after relegation after relegation, wasn't maybe quite at the level that Chelsea wanted. You can disagree with that if you want. And even some of the ones that before, like Christensen left on a free transfer, Tammy Abraham wasn't suitable to the manager's tactics, I, and Billy Gilmore, all of these things. I don't agree with some of them, but you can make the case that there was a footballing reason to move on and try to improve. They'd all had a taste of first-team football or more. And and that doesn't resonate with Lewis. Um, nine appearances last season, 18 years old. And it felt unnecessary. And so some of the players will look at that and think, well, if that's what's happening to somebody who's just broken through, will I even get to break through? And... Some players will look at a bunch of signings in their positions. Tudor Mendelado would have looked at all the left-footed attacking options ahead of him, for example. And Diego Moreira coming in at development squad level the year after. Omari Hutchinson coming in at development squad level. And Harvey Vale still being there. And Noni Madueke. And then transfer links to Michael Olise and Bradley Barcola and anyone else in that vein. And thought, well, now I'm going to try my luck elsewhere. And goes to Anderlecht and good luck to him. You'll find players who are committed and say, no, I'm absolutely going to stay here. I'm going to fight. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to get into that first team. You'll have players who say, I'm not going to sign a scholarship at 16. I'm going to go elsewhere. It's the nature of the beast throughout. I'm reticent to say that it's going to cause uh, a flurry of talent through the exit door at Cobham on the playing side or the coaching side. There's inevitable frustration. This is, you come to expect it you know that a lot of your work is going to go unappreciated by your own employers, but that doesn't mean you aren't doing a highly, highly successful job in turning out. Well, it's Champions League caliber footballers year in and year out at Cobham. You look at the where they're going. You've got Fikar Samori and 
Ruben Loftus Cheek at Milan. You've got Inter in for Chalaba, even though he hasn't gone there. You've got Jamal Musiala at Bayern. You've got Mason Mount, Manchester United. These are all Champions League clubs, and let's not forget Chelsea aren't in the Champions League this season. Mm-hmm. They're going on to play at a high standard of football, and you can. And then Tino Livramento and Lewis Hall at Newcastle. There'll be Champions League opportunities for them this season. Yeah, the problem will remain that elite finishing school whether the players end up in the first team or not and for a lot of players they'll they'll see that with an honesty uh, as a matter of fact that I'm here this is this essentially me going to an elite university get my degree and go out into the real world we will certainly I'll speak for myself I would prefer the majority of them end up in Chelsea's men's first team squad because I think both they're good enough and it's advantageous for the club to do so and to spend their money where it really needs to be spent rather than on speculative signings from South America or on David Astro Fofana or even 100 million on Mikhail Mudrik at this point. It's not 100 million, it's a potential 100 million. Let's say it's 60 hour. Um, certainly haven't seen anything from him that suggests that it was money well spent. And you can be a little bit more aggressive with the money you want to spend if you fill your squad with Coppen graduates you can afford to go to 115 million for Casado and not sell Lewis Hall if you haven't run through 800 million pounds of spending in the last year uh, some of it at Coppen players Coppen graduates expense mm-hmm. uh, for sure I mean there's still Coppen pedigree uh, Naz tweeted out the Chelsea Academy player of the season winners right 2015 Dom Solanke leads the line at Bournemouth Fakao Tomori to your point AC Milan made to the Champions League semifinals. His one Serie A. Mason Mount at Manchester United. Reese James in 2018. He's Chelsea's captain. 2019 was Connor Gallagher. He's at Chelsea. Future a little bit undefined, unfortunately. Like majority of the, He's the new Mason Mount, by the way. The lightning rod player. Like I don't know where the re- lack of respect for his work ethic and his ability to play anywhere in the middle of the park. Um, it, it, it's beyond me. 2020 was Billy Gilmore. He's at Brighton playing week in, week out. 2021, Tina Levermento just went to Newcastle. 2022, Harvey Vale, who's on loan at Bristol. And now Lewis Hall, 2023, who just went to Newcastle. So there's definitely a clear clear um, development path there, which, which is good. But uh, tell you what, it's just, it, you, know, you know, you know how I feel. I know how you feel. Such good depth players at a minimum there. And uh, yeah. And that's just the highlight of the list. That list doesn't include so many players who have gone to bigger and, and better things. Off my head, Mark Gahey, not in there. Tammy Abraham, not in there. Olena, not in there. He's playing in the Premier League now again, but Nottingham Forest. Uh, you could go round and round and round and round and you could build a functional 25-player squad out of Coppen graduates who are playing at a high level that would do respectably in the Premier League, which I think speaks to the point of if you make the most of your academy produce on the pitch and not just view them as a financial asset, then you can top it up with the Enzo Fernandezes of this world and the Moises Casados of this world, the the so-called elite. And to me, be in a, a much healthier place. But the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Um history tells us that spending significant amounts of money doesn't necessarily equate to success doesn't mean it will doesn't mean it won't this time it's a radical change of approach in recruitment we were promised at the start of this takeover a year and a bit ago that Chelsea wouldn't sell the future to fund the present and the intention behind that was that we wouldn't be selling off academy players to buy 27, 28, 29, 30 year olds and while they haven't done that in a roundabout way they have sold the future to fund the present because of the present spending Mm -hmm. the only silver lining that you can have in that regard is that they are at least signing younger players with theoretical high sell on value if even 50% of the players they've signed hit and turn into much much better players, double their value, triple their value then it'll be fine from a a money making standpoint whether it's fine on the pitch again we'll find out but you just I keep going back to that message they wouldn't sell off 
as many homegrown players to fund an alternative vision. Uh, and the last couple of weeks of this window will be interesting as to whether Martin remains, as to whether Gallagher remains, to whether Armando Breuer remains, and anyone else who you'd consider a worthy academy graduate to be involved with the senior squad right now. Absolutely. And we're going to take our first ad break there. When we get back, we're going to pivot over to the matches. So thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, Phil, we're a little bit of a hard pivot here. Uh, I think you and I could probably go all day on that topic, but there are some exciting things to talk about when it comes to the Academy and the fact that uh, the Dev Squad are off and running. They've got two matches played, one win, one loss. How have they started the season? Maybe frame it up. Any new changes? Any kind of new structural uh, differences? We know that a lot of their top players from last season are not out on loan. I think what I say... Uh, Charlie Webster, um, uh, uh, Dion Rankin. Uh, Amari, yep, Amari Hutchinson, obviously Chester Cassidy, big ones. David Dautro Fofano was with this group for a little bit. He's out, but uh, yeah, maybe tee up the the Dev Squad look and feel the season. Yeah, so they've had a couple of games. They had a, a really good preseason. They had uh, four matches against National League opposition, Borumwood, Barnet, Aldershot, and Ebbsfleet and then a couple of home friendlies against the Brentford B team and against the Phoenix All-Stars Academy from Jamaica, which is the team that Chelsea signed Dewan Richards from. And Richards will be joining Chelsea in October, I believe. Set to join the development squad, which we can talk about probably closer to the time. But anyway, as you said, there's there's been a big change in the personnel as you kind of get year on year as players graduate and move on to bigger things, um, go out on loan, leave the club in, in every case. But... There's been a few holdovers um, to keep this group experienced. Alfie Gilchrist has captained the team in the first two games of the season after spending the summer with Pochettino's squad in the United States. Everyone was expecting him to go out on loan, but shortly before the start of the season, he told the Chelsea website that he'd be staying until January, which will be interesting. It's, um, it's useful for the development squad, which will have a change of guard in defence. Dylan Williams and Zach Sturge have both remained throughout, but they're both open or the club are open to loaning them out for the right situation should that come along they've been outstanding this summer as you might expect but then you've got newcomers Diego Moreira Alex Matos um, from outside and then you've got players who are coming through from the under 18s Harrison Murray Campbell played excellently against Blackburn after a really strong preseason. he didn't turn 17 until the start of August but in at least one of the preseason friendlies as a 16 year old he finished the game as captain kind of speaks volumes as to the quality that he can provide. Keanu Dyer, who's 16 himself and a first-year scholar a year, an age group below Murray Campbell, has been involved with the group all summer, started both league games so far. And it's it's a new look. It's, it's a team that will take some time to find consistency at PL2 level, and that speaks to the first two results. They beat Blackburn 6-1 on opening day. It was a resounding 6-1 win that they deserved. Um, and then lost 2-3 uh, at home to Brighton a week later. Uh, they were two 0 up in that one. They were they were looking very very good. Uh, they were they were confident. They were flying. They probably should have won the game. But Brighton played very very well in the second half. Um, tactically superior. Made the right decisions at the right time. Took their chances and and held Chelsea at arm's length. And that's going to happen from time to time. We saw the Chelsea finish third in this league last season. There's been a change to the competition format instead of two divisions now, as we had Chelsea fighting relegation a couple of years ago. Everybody goes into one league table, 26 teams. The top 16 will go into playoffs at the end of the season. So you'd hope Chelsea end up in that 16 out of 26. They're far too good overall to not be in that position. But the change of structure will encourage more than a few teams to field younger lineups. Uh, not, not necessarily more experimental, but keep the focus on development rather than where well, we have to stay in this division and potentially draft in senior players and keep players around instead of letting them out on loan. And to that point, Chelsea's having 16-year-olds at the start of the season uh, and uh, more than a few 17-year-olds um, is probably the way you can expect them to, to move on this season. I mean, I'm excited regardless, right? These teams are fun to watch. Uh, they're all fighting for kind of their first professional contracts is always right. So... Um, uh, I'm a big dev squad fan. I think the 18s are a little bit more loosey goosey, uh, with the, 
you know, craziness and the players moving up and down at their level a little bit more. Obviously, they're younger. Um, but the dev squad, I've started to appreciate that, like, they're molding into more of that mature footballer versus just the raw talent and, um, you know, refining the skills, reading of the game, flow, tempo. These are all things I think you start to see from, like, the managerial team and, and the players as well at this level. So hopefully we can get more on TV. I know the last match wasn't. Um, I had a little bit of time, and I was I was hoping to watch it on f- last Friday, but uh, it didn't didn't come about. But next yeah, one. Yeah, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is a really stupid, uh, and I don't say that lightly, rule that the Premier League enforce where if there is a Premier League game being live broadcast on Sky or TNT Sports in the UK, then clubs are no, aren't allowed to stream their under-21 broadcasts alongside it. Um, no reason has ever been given for that, apart from the Premier League trying to protect the Golden Goose. I'm not sure the few hundred or few thousand fans who are tuning into Chelsea versus Brighton under-21s um, would be swayed and not watching that by choosing to watch Nottingham Forest against Sheffield United or something, but who knows? The other one is Chelsea picking and choosing what they want to broadcast when they want to broadcast it. Um, it can be inconsistent, not just season to season, but month to month. But I can encourage that everyone who's listening just to let the club know on whatever forms, whatever mediums you have open to you, that watching the Academy play live from wherever you are in the world, um, watching them online, um, would certainly be favourable to you. And the, bigger, the, the, the bigger the voice, the more interest there is, the more chance there is of Chelsea doing it because at the end of the day, it'll make the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I just maybe a couple of names to watch this season. Like I said, I kind of shouted out Cassidy. He came in middle of the year, but Omari Hutchinson was really, really popular one to watch last season. Um, uh, Charlie Webster, top top couple of names that you see, and and who's captain? Some of the the main points. Yeah, so Alfie Gilchrist is captain the team so far, and you think he will until. Uh, January, if and when he goes out on loan. Zach Sturge had it in preseason. Again, if he goes out on loan, it can move around. In terms of wants to watch, we'll start with Ronnie Stutter because he scored two against Blackburn, two against Brighton. So he's got four in two, which came off the back of six in three to finish his preseason. He got two against Ebbsfleet, hat trick against Brentford, one against Aldershot. And it's it's been really pleasing to see for a player who lost most of his under 18 season through injury. He'd missed some time before that with. And he broke a foot, and then he broke the other foot. And it just took a long time for him to get back. And he got eight to ten games, starts or subs, at the back end of last season. And just started to get going again. Scored a couple of goals. And you just wanted him to have a preseason where he could focus on football rather than fitness. And that's exactly what he got. And you're seeing the quality. He's one of those sharp, instinctive, Michael Owen-esque forwards he's not a big hold-up player and that was kind of why Brighton ended up winning they isolated him against their bigger centre halves and forced Chelsea to play long balls to him all day which did work for the opening goal but over the course of the game it was it's not necessarily going to win Chelsea matches but he's been sharp he's a good finisher he's a good first time finisher he runs hard he'll run the channels he can create things for himself but he's a lot of his goals this summer have been these clinical first time finishes from short passes or, or cutbacks from wide areas and this is a Chelsea team that will continue to supply those chances so he'll score goals as long as he stays fit and we can all cross our fingers and touch wood that he does so um, Leo Castledine also started the season fantastically he turned 18 very very recently which seems impossible for how long he's been on our radars um, he's one of those who has a birthday right at the end of the academic calendar year that English football's age groups work on but he scored a free kick against Blackburn Um, he's got this real special ability to get it up and down over a wall from right on the edge of the area it's not the 25 yard range it's sort of the 20 to 22 yard range which a lot of players find really hard because of the the lack of space to get that dip on the ball he seems to be expert at it he did miss a penalty in the same game so maybe 12 yards is too close in for him but he did a great job there and then even though he didn't affect the score sheet against Brighton he did a really good tactical job um, against Tarek Lamptey who was playing for Brighton in his return to fitness and form Um, Leo tucked in sort of the left winger in a 4-4-2 but not quite it was mostly to try to shackle Lamptey and then 
have the space just inside to affect the game in an attacking way. And you can see the tactical intelligence. You could see he, he plays like a 25-year-old who's played 150 senior games, which is so, so impressive for somebody who's only just turned 18. I mean, there'll, there'll be EFL clubs out there looking for loan opportunities with him and he could probably handle it. I'm not saying that Chelsea will let him out by the end of the window because I think he's going to be one of the best players in PL2 this season and a real asset for Chelsea to keep in this squad. But you can start with those two and then you can just go throughout the rest of the team. It'll be a big year for Jimmy Tauriano in midfield who's looked good over the summer. Um, he's one who's missed a lot of time over the two, three years he's been here with injury. Just pray that he can stay fit and show what he's capable of. Williams and Sturge, if they stay, will be really, really, really strong players. Williams has been playing as a, a centre-back all summer in a three and then in a two at times, which isn't his natural game. And you can watch him just go off on marauding runs like he's playing at left-back or left-wing-back because he's capable of doing it. He can affect the game in so many ways. Um, I get the questions all the time. Who are the players to watch this season in this age group and that age group? And there are players that you can highlight based on their performances. But what I'll always say to everybody is just, just watch the games and watch the highlights and... Focus on the ones that interest you and the way that you enjoy watching football. Some players, some people are into centre halves who do all the defensive dirty work. Some people are into the Keanu Dias, the the midfield number six is the deep line playmakers, the orchestrators. Some people love wing play. Some people love clinical goal scorers. Everyone has their their niche in terms of what lights them up most in watching football. And if you watch the academy, you can get that every single game from so many different players. So just tune in. Turn up to a game at King's Meadow if you're local and and just enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey because everyone's on a different progression path and it's just fundamentally fun to watch. Yeah, well, without a doubt. So I'm excited. Uh, a new season, new optimism. We talked a little bit, you know, the, the, the dreary jury at the beginning, but the fresh sense of optimism and the new matches are what's exciting because... You and I are going to say, hey, here are probably some players to watch. At the end of the season, we're going to look back and be like, wow, did not see that player having the season they had. And that's what's so exciting about this group. So It really is. And they've got a bunch of new competitions this season. They're not in the Under-19 Champions League. We've spoken about that a lot. We did suggest that they might enter the Premier League Cup, which is Under-21s, and the Premier League International Cup, and they have done so. The International Cup, despite being played in England exclusively because UEFA won't let them do it otherwise... Uh, they'll play Celtic, they'll play Lyon, they'll play Dinamo Zagreb, they'll play Valencia. All of those teams will be coming to King's Meadow over the next few months. And they'll be playing Colchester, Luton and Leeds in the, the BL Cup. So it's a bunch of teams that they haven't played at this level or haven't even played at any level. Chelsea versus Colchester, I don't think has happened at senior level ever, or certainly not in recent times. They played in the FA Youth Cup more than a decade ago, but that's an opportunity for new faces, new opportunities, new challenges, new environments. So it's going to be a little bit different this season, but different doesn't have to be bad. Different can be just as entertaining and intriguing, and there'll be plenty for us to talk about throughout the season, I'm sure. I love it. All right, second ad break. When we get back, uh, we got the U18s and uh, obviously a little bit look ahead. So thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, U18 ball. I love to see it. They have had one match maximum excitement, maximum points. What is going on? Same question for you with the U18s. Who, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, so they started this past weekend, um, which was a week later than everybody else. Each division, north and south, in the under-18 Premier League has 13 teams. So mathematically, somebody has to have a bye week every week, and Chelsea were first out of the hat to be having a bye there. So they came in and hosted Crystal Palace in their opener. Palace had beaten Southampton 5-0 in their opener a week earlier. And it was, it was a high-level match. Palace are a good team. They took an early lead. And they held on to that lead for a long, long time. This match had 21 minutes of added time in total. Um, not all of it to do with the change in officiating standards. There were six minutes in the first half. One of the Palace players went off injured. Hopefully that's not too serious. And there were 14 minutes in the second half, which was mostly because every single Crystal Palace player, to a man, at some point, um, suffered cramp. Um, a couple of them weren't able to continue a couple of them had to limp on and continue it's not necessarily one of those early things it was an intense high level match and it's to Chelsea's credit that 
Uh, they didn't use the substitute until the seventh minute of second half added on time and they didn't look like they were flagging at any point. The the physical standards and the work they've put in in pre-season were clearly telling because they were able to turn this one around late on. Two goals from Danel McNeely, who had a really good year last year. He's a prolific goal scorer. He scored his first Dev Squad goal the week before as a substitute against Blackburn. He got the two there. Chelsea start the season with a win. Exactly what you love to see. And it sets them up nicely for a trip to Aston Villa the weekend as we record this. Hopefully going two for two. Head into the Under-18 Cup. And then the back end of September, they've got Fulham, Norwich and Arsenal. And hopefully we can be talking about a similarly good start to the season there because they haven't won this league in about five years now. It looks to me to be relatively wide open compared to previous years, which have been dominated by like a super West Ham team and a super Fulham team and a super Arsenal team. It's early, but I think that the depth and quality that Chelsea have available to them this year should put them in contention to to return to the summit. I love it, right? Because, yeah, the U18 League, it has been... It's North and South Conference. Um, it they, I remember that West Ham team. They absolutely ran away with it last season. It wasn't even close. Oh, and they won the Youth Cup as well. They beat Arsenal yeah. 5-1 at the Emirates. They were a class apart, and... That happens. Chelsea did it year upon year upon year, and you can't sustain that forever. And then Arsenal came along with a really strong team and did it. Uh, and then Fulham had two really strong years. And you'll see the fruits of those labours come through, and the same from West Ham if they're given the opportunity. But the charm is you, you'll end up with teams that are really good for a year, maybe two at this level, and then can they keep that consistency going? That was why Chelsea were outstanding for that five-year FA Youth Cup run, because they had the quality to keep bringing through. This year, we've only had two rounds so far. And there are a couple of teams who look like they're capable, but I mean, we're talking about which Chelsea players to watch. You can lead with McNeely and his goals there, but they've got Travis Akomia back in, in central defence. He was excellent in his first half of his first year here at Chelsea after signing from Watford and then suffered a really bad injury against Bradford in the Youth Cup back in January. Didn't play again last season, but he's back, captain of the team imperious in central defence whether it's alongside Harrison Murray Campbell as it was here or Caden Wilson as it has been most of the pre-season with Akamea and Wilson or Akamea and Sahid Olagunju or any combination of those two you've got two like twin tower centre-halves and what we've seen over the pre-season is the ability that they have to play a super super high line because they've got the legs to turn and run back and and eat up ground you can afford to take that risk in the high line that lets Chelsea play much higher up the pitch and they beat Man City 5-1 in a friendly at Cobham it was a younger Man City team than it was a Chelsea team which needs to be said but so many of the goals that Chelsea scored that day were from high pressing forcing turnovers because they were able to play the high line that starts with the athleticism of their centre halves and the full backs outside them it gives you so many more possibilities than if you're forced to defend deeper. You, you don't necessarily carry players at academy level, but you do work with what you've got. And if your centre-halves can't play high up, don't ask them to every time. You want to challenge them, see what mistakes they make. Some clubs will do this more than others. But fundamentally, this is the first stage of the professional development stage. You're here to teach players how to win. And... They showed this time and again against Palace. It was a brave performance. It was a patient performance. You had Michael Golding at the 10. He's primed for a really strong year. The two wingers, Tyreek George and Atto Amper, are going to excite people. I think some of the first years you might see Frankie Runham really impress. He's got the eye for the spectacular. He's uh, something of a free kick expert. He scored five or six for the under 16s last season. Uh, for the Youth Cup, neither of them were involved here. Jimmy J. Morgan and Ishe Samuel Smith are both signed over the last few months Morgan in January and Ishe back in July they're both England under 17 internationals um, and when it comes to youth cup time Chelsea could theoretically put out a team of eight or nine players who are regulars in the England youth ranks which speaks to the quality that they have at their disposal because the team that beat Crystal Palace didn't feature very many of those the, the, you could Chelsea's second team for the youth cup could arguably be better than 90% of teams. And I know I'm saying this early, but I'm going to stake my claim now that this will be the year that Chelsea win it again. They are, they are definitely targeting it. They've got quality. They've just signed Oli Harrison from Newcastle United, who's a nice, tall, upright midfielder. 
nominally a six, that sort of deeper playmaker, but he's rangy, he can pass, he can get around, he can get into the attacking half as an eight or a ten and do all of that. He's another one. He's a 2007 born, so he's a year below the 2060s with England, but just the depth and, and quality that they have available here sets up for a really exciting year. I love it. Super excited. Uh, want to see what this group does. Again, the results are going to probably be a little bit all over the place, but you're going to get some some just real just excitement. I mean, there. I remember being 16, 17, 18, uh, being able to play these big teams and and go around like this is exciting, super, super exciting. Are they are they pretty young again this season? Because remember, we talk about how we always reload and Chelsea tend to be younger and it's almost a disadvantage at times because they're playing against players that are 20, 21, 22 and they're maybe 18, 19, 20 in, um, in these matches. Yeah, it's going to change week to week and certainly into the second half of the season, it tends to become a little bit younger. The team against Palace only had one first year. So when I say first year, you have players who sign scholarships at the end of their under 16 season they are under 17s for this season and then the players who did it last year are under 18s and that's your age eligibility you can't play beyond the under 18s so typically most teams are filled of first years and second years you will have some under 16s involved and Chelsea had Shimera Mayoka, um the signing from Brighton a couple of years ago he's an under 16 he came on in this game. Caden Wilson was the only first year who started, and he only started because Josh Achenpong pulled out injured during the warm-up. So otherwise it would have been a full second-year team. But that won't be the case all season long. They've got a talented group of first years that will get their opportunities, um, certainly as it goes on. And certainly because November is the Under-17 World Cup in Indonesia, and Chelsea will send a lot of players out to that. It's the 2006 group we were talking about there. That'll be Keanu Dyer from the 21s. That'll be... Akamea, that'll be Somta Boniface, Michael Golding. It'll be possibly Tyreek George, Jimmy J. Morgan, Ishe Samuel-Smith. Again, they could send nine or ten. They probably won't because of the way that England pick their squads and the depth that they have. It's a really, really good group. But Chelsea will lose some players in November from both age groups. And that'll be reflected in the fixture list as they've tried to tailor it a little bit so that the players aren't stretched too thin across too many competitions. But at the same time, when that happens... It's somebody else's opportunity to step up. We saw it last year. Chelsea reached the knockout round of the EFL Trophy and they had to go to Cheltenham in December without some players who had been with Graham Potter's squad in Abu Dhabi for a midwinter World Cup training camp and friendly against Aston Villa. They didn't get to play. Some of them came back the day before and travelled over to Cheltenham without training. And That was a younger team. It was a less familiar team, but they had the opportunity to step up and play against men in a knockout environment you put them put the challenges in front of them and see how it happens it's not always about winning it but at these levels you prefer it to be the the driving focus because fundamentally you're trying to develop winning footballers whether at chelsea or somewhere else yeah well totally fair um i'm excited you you always get me excited by these players and things like that um i do want to ask you before we wrap here if it's okay chelsea have been linked, albeit lightly potentially, with Fuller and Balogun. Um, a recent American, I might add. Apologies for your loss, Phil. Uh, he is hanging out with us in the U.S. men's national team. But he was in the dev squad with Arsenal since he was 16. Spent five years there. Breakout in Ligue 1 last season. I... I'm guessing you have a pretty decent take on him as a player and maybe you could shed some color on what kind of a player he is based on what you saw. Yeah, so if I, uh, you might indulge me in resurrecting a message I sent to somebody on October the 17th, 2017 and I'll post this on socials as and when it's necessary but I'd watched Chelsea play Arsenal's 18s um, relatively close to this date and uh, the message was, I really like Balogun. He's got good presence in attack. He knows how to play with his back to goal. He's got decent link up, good first touch, decent finisher. He deserves a look. And this was talking about England representation at the time. He hadn't been involved with any of the age groups. But I liked what I saw from him in that environment as a 16-year-old. And I've liked what I've seen ever since. He did really, really well in Liga for Ram last season. He can do a little bit of everything. Um, 
he's not one. You can't typecast him as a certain type of forward based on his looks or his body type or his playing oh. style. He's he scored a ton of goals in a, a defence first team, and there's some really good analysis from Seb Shapley, Seb C on Twitter, who's a guest of, uh, and a friend of this show, and Ludinka man. Um, I would encourage you to check out his analysis because he would have seen a lot more of him close up first hand in France than I have. But I'm, I'm a fan. Whether it's a deal that Chelsea should do at a certain price point, I don't know. I think he'd be an asset if he joins Chelsea, though, um, and a player that I have liked since seeing him relatively young at Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I figured you might. Of course, you've got a nice little cheeky 2017 text about him, which is uh, awesome to hear. The more I kind of look at uh, the data and some of the, the radars and things like that, I'm not even putting on the American hat right now. If you need depth and someone to provide something different, or you can even play off of Nico Jackson, it doesn't have to be an either or situation. It can very much be an and. He seems to check a lot of boxes right now, uh, especially when, unfortunately, the injury bug is going around again. Um, he's going to provide is, that versatility. Yeah. And the, the price point is a separate debate, but it's a market that isn't particularly easy to go out and get yourself a striker. Uh, Victor Osimhen, he's been priced out of. Randall Kolomouani, probably priced out of. Uh, Harry Kane, gone, even if he was a realistic target in the first place. The the, the totem centre forward, number nine, prototypical type, whatever you think. The only one that seems to be out there that is even on Chelsea's radar and realistically gettable is Dusan Vlavic. And there are significant doubts about whether he's the sort of player that you invest that sort of money into. And my preference, if you are dropping 50 to 60 million on a player, you'd go for Balogun over Vlavic, each to their own. But I, I've always liked what I've seen from Balogun. Yeah, well, good. Um, uh, again, not to divert away from Chelsea's academy too much, but I did, you know, as for being linked, figured you'd have a good perspective on that. We'll see. Um, I, you know, look, would we love to see an Arsenal youngster come to the Chelsea first team and do well? Yes. Yes, we would. Like, uh, there's always that. But uh, if he's a quality player, then, of course, we should be looking at him um, and see if we can make a deal happen. If Arteta is going to overlook him, we might as well bring in some of the top youngsters from around the continent if we are so blind to our own, unfortunately. Matt Law said that. I think I think that's the thing you're probably going to resonate with is if Lewis Hall, Connor Gallagher, um, who else are we looking at? doesn't matter. Uh, we're at Newcastle or Brighton or Southampton. Well, I guess not them anymore, right? But the point being, Chelsea would be sniffing around, looking to grab them up. Oh, but absolutely. What, you know? But for that damn FFP yeah. and the way it's, they look at their accounting I've said, books. I've said it so many times this summer. It's that it is extremely bold, brave, or stupid, depending on your position, to assume that you can recruit and develop better players from elsewhere than your in-house proven world-class academy can produce and again we can only wait and see how it unfolds but it's, it's so many it, yes if Lewis Hall was playing for Santos if any we're signing David Washington Angelo Gabriel Andre Santos who were all doing accomplished things but by comparison to what some of Chelsea's own youngsters are doing Possibly not as accomplished, but you know we've we've spoken about this already. Let's not get yeah. too drawn back into doing it again. Yeah. Last thing I'll say is uh, Cassidy off of the banger, get a stoppage time winner for Leicester. Now that he made that move official, um, early positive signs. Yeah, absolutely. Enzo Maresca seems really happy with him. It's a manager who knows him or is familiar with him from crossing paths, just in general through Italian football. Maresca spent some time there and some time in English development football, but it's impossible to not know him from his under-20 World Cup um, experience and coming through Inter. He's in good hands there. They've got a very particular setup under Maresca and they play with two central attacking midfielders. Kin and Dewsbury Hall is one of them, homegrown, really, really good player. And the other spot they haven't found a proper solution for. They've tied Dennis Pratt there. They've tried... Uh, Wilfred and Didi there, neither of them really suited to it, and Cassidy is suited to it. He was only a sub in that game because it was his first game, and sort of you need to get more time familiar with training and settled in. But he'll play a lot, not least because I think there's a, a penalty, a financial penalty, if he doesn't get enough minutes. Um, but he'll he'll earn them on merit. He'll play 
And we spoke about him at the back end of last season. What's the next step on loan for him? Are you going to put him into a team that asks him to do more on the ball and develop other areas of his game? Or are you going to put him into a position that accentuates everything he does well? And I think we've got the latter here. The, the Maresca's always spoken about him. We need players to get in the box and score goals because that's how you win matches. That's the most important thing. And that's what he'll be tasked with. And that's what he did on debut. It's really exciting. Um, and there's an interesting crop of players out on loan this season. One of whom is Lewis Hall, officially, but we'll, <laughs> we'll move on. Um, Amari Hutchinson to Ipswich, who, um, despite only being promoted to the Championship this season, are widely viewed as a promotion contender for Premier League football. He'll get his minutes over the course of a 50-game season. He has started as a substitute most often in the early games, and that's that's fine. He's got the talent to game, change games as an impact sub late on. Um, Charlie Webster's at Heron Vane, again, a little bit like Hutchinson and maybe like Mason Mount when he went to Vitesse. He won't necessarily start straight away, but come back to me in November once he's acclimatised to a new league, senior football for the first time, a new country, uh, figures out what his role in the team is. He's already been spoken of highly by staff at Heron Vane. It's just about being patient and letting those opportunities come at the right time. He'll do well over there. Dion Rankin started very, very well at Exeter in a right wing back role that suits him down to the ground. Harvey Vale's gone to Bristol Rovers, which I think is a level below where he should be playing, but he went to the Championship last season. Got injured at Hull. Managerial change, we've spoken about it a lot of times before. It didn't work out, but there was a perception maybe that stuck that he wasn't ready for Championship football. I think it's a false perception. As far as I'm aware, the interest that was shown by Championship clubs this season was for him to play as a left-back or a left-wing back, and his interest was rightly to play as a more attacking op- um player and that's what Bristol Rovers have offered him he's part of a nice little group of ex-Chelsea players down at Bristol Rovers um, Scott Sinclair's there Josh Grant is there uh, Luke McCormick um, so there's a few familiar faces for long time followers of the academy uh, and then there's a few players dotted around here and there you've got uh, Gagas Lonino who's gone to Juppen in Belgium you've got Angelo Gabriel at Strasbourg Dastro Fofana at Union Berlin there's it's a small group and they've only got two international spots left for some of the players who need to go out before the end of the window. You'll see um, Bashir Humphreys probably go out. You'll see Tino Andrew go. I think there was a report earlier this week that he'll go to Portsmouth, which, like Vale, is a level below where he should be. We've seen Andrew play in the championship for Huddersfield over the last two years and, like Vale, injuries stopped him progressing to the level that we know they're both capable of based on everything they've demonstrated in the Chelsea shirt. And in both cases, I think you're taking one step back to take two steps forward. If you can settle, especially the first half of this year, and remind everybody of the calibre of talent we're talking about, then the wheels start to move a little bit more quickly and you get back up to 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 your rightful place. But there's going to be some movement in and out over the final week or two of the window. It won't be a significant amount just because of the restrictions that Chelsea have on international loans. But it's, it's an interesting year to follow a lot of players. There's more than we think of. We are getting into a bit of a jam on these loan players. I appreciate you kind of keeping everybody apprised on Twitter of like those slots and everything like that. But uh, I think that's a good place to wrap, Phil. Uh, obviously, follow at Chelsea Youth for all the updates. Um, I'm going to do you a favor. If there's a stream link, he will post it. You don't need to ask. Just check the feed. Uh, what do we? Time. What do we got coming up next? We've got the 21s away to Norwich on Friday the 25th. That's at Carrow Road. It won't be broadcast live as far as I'm aware. The 18s are at Aston Villa on Saturday the 26th. The 21s are back in action on the 29th in the EFL Trophy. They're up at Milton Keynes. They've got them first, and then they play Northampton and Oxford in a competition that has treated them well over the years. The Milton Keynes game will be available for a broadcast, but you will have to pay the club, Milton Keynes, £10 for the privilege of watching it online. Lucky us. All right. Appreciate you, Phil, as always. Uh, Been a bit of a tough end of the month. Hopefully, when we come back in September, uh, there'll be a little bit more excitement. But uh, always appreciate you. You've got your finger on the pulse better than anyone else. Don't listen to them, kids. Phil's the man. More content this week. Let's see. This will probably come out Thursday. We play Friday, an unfortunate timing of a match, but uh, we'll get a podcast out more over the weekend. So anyways, until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do? Keep the blue flag flying high.